So good evening, happy Earth Day, and welcome to Copperfield's Books virtual event with Frank Mortimer in conversation with Bonnie Morris. My name is Jamie Madsen, and I'm the Marketing and Events Coordinator here at Copperfield's Books, and I'll also be your host for the evening. For 40 years, Copperfield's Books has been committed to literature, education, and creating community together. So because event proceeds allow us to continue hosting this free program, I'd like to take a moment here at the beginning to thank you all for your continued support. And just a couple of items to note before we get started. I'll be using the chat box to provide links to view upcoming Copperfields events, details for purchasing tonight's title, as well as a 10% discount code. And I'll also include my contact details for post-event information. Additionally, the Q&A box will be your go-to with any questions or comments for the speaker. If you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see an icon that says Q&A. Please submit your questions here rather than replying to my post in the chat box. So without further ado, I'm excited to introduce tonight's author, Frank Mortimer. Frank is an adjunct instructor at the Cornell University Master Beekeeping Program, Vice President of the New Jersey State Beekeepers Association, and a certified master beekeeper. Frank has published multiple articles in Bee Culture Magazine and has led beekeeping seminars across New Jersey and at the New York Botanical Garden. In addition, he successfully campaigned for his hometown of Ridgewood to become New Jersey's first Bee City USA. Frank is married, has three children, and beekeeping is something the whole family enjoys doing together. In conversation with Frank tonight is Bonnie Morse. Bonnie and her husband, Greg, are the co-founders of Bonnie Bee and Company, Marin County's source for local bees, beekeeping support, and sustainably sourced products from the hive. So they are with us this evening to discuss Frank's newest title, Bee People in the Bugs They Love. So I know we're all really excited to hear from, I guess, some of the bee's biggest ambassadors. So why don't you take it away for us, Bonnie? Thank you. And, and uh, Frank, I'm taking my veil off because I look super dark like Morticia. So <laughs> we're going to I'll take mine off too. Even though it's a yeah. very natural thing to wear, I will take it off. Uh, and Bonnie, it's great to see you. Thank you for joining us. And I'd like I to think thank- it's, always, it's always great to see you. And I'm so excited about your new book. I mean, it's so much fun to read about. And I, and I think, I mean, if you're a beekeeper, obviously it'd be hysterical, but also for people that aren't um beekeepers i mean there's so much interesting information well and and bonnie just like i know that you do a lot of talks out in the public sorry you off it's it's kind of a downer but oh i'm sorry i was saying that i know that you do a lot of talks as well in public and so when i had done so many talks i kind of refined how i said things so non-beekeepers would understand it and so that's how when i wrote the book it was including a lot of those ways to express it so everybody could kind of understand it. Yeah, no, and you you do such a great job of that. But uh, so for Earth Day though, I mean, it's kind of bummer, but it's at the beginning of your book. Do you want to read that, uh, that, you know, experience you had very early on um, with your first mentor and and the people and and the guy that was afraid of having bees near his children? Sure. That's Worm who had moved in. So the, um, This is uh, on page 27. At that point, it was clear that the homeowner was not going to listen to logic. It was also at this point that I first realized that too many people want a perfectly manicured yard so they can experience nature without nature getting too close to them. It doesn't occur to most of these people that they have a beautiful yard because of the bugs, worms, and dirt, not in spite of them. Many people would just prefer an artificial yard if it looked like the real thing and came without all the mess. Yeah, I mean, that's like, as we look at Earth Day and we realize, you know, we want to make a difference, but the difference takes place right in each of our yards. Um, Yeah, and and and, it's true. Yeah, it it feels like, you know, I mean, that's one of the big things, like as beekeepers, you know, you talk about like becoming closer to nature, Um, you know, people that start keeping bees, like, you know, they start thinking about what their bees want to eat, what they need to eat to get closer to. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting thing that happens. And just that whole concept of time that totally changes for us. And you mentioned that, you know, uh, about this whole concept of time with bees, 
with with honey with just the cycles in general do you want to talk about that sure yeah it's it, it's funny like um bonnie and i talk about this all the time that when when you're in the hive itself you can kind of lose track of time because i call beekeeping forced zen because you have to be present or you're going to get stung and so when you're you know standing over a box that contains up to sixty thousand stinging insects and you're holding a part of that in your hands, which could be about 4,000 of them, and it, all your senses are engaged. So not only are you seeing the bees, but you're smelling the honey and the propolis, and then you're touching the, and you can feel the wax. And if a bee comes, you can feel because they're fuzzy. And so it's like, you're just in this moment. And that's what I, it, it kind of, you lose track of the outside time because you're just so amazed by what's happening and right in front of you and that they don't care that you're watching them. Would you say that's yeah, how it is and, for you? Yeah, and just the whole concept. Of, oh, absolutely. As well as when you're in them, as well as just like the concept of like a whole season. You know, we're so used to now, you know, and it wasn't that long ago where people like fruit was actually seasonal, you know, like you could only get it at a certain season. But now it's this instant gratification of you can get pretty much whatever you want, whenever you want it, you know, because it's grown in a different part of the world that has a different season. And with the bees, when they're right there in your backyard and your local time, you know, it's like you say, you know, your honey season is totally different than my honey season. And, and when the bees miss that, it's a whole year till you wait. So here in Marin, with our mega drought, we're already seeing our hills starting to brown up, which usually doesn't happen until about you know early June. And for, so whatever they haven't been able to do now, it's going to be a whole year before they can do it. Yeah, it's it's funny. Like we always say that the beekeeping calendar starts in September or August because the bees are preparing through the fall, so they have enough food to eat through the winter, so they can start up again in the spring. And then once spring starts that um, like you're saying, Bonnie, that it, it, the weather can really impact what the bees are able to do. If it's too cold, too dry, and, and things aren't, the flowers aren't blooming and there's not enough nectar, then you're not going to get as much honey that year as you would in, in previous years. Yeah. I mean, so here, uh, you know, very different than your season. I always tell beekeepers, it's like when our hills start to turn brown, our iconic Marin Hills, um, comb building is done for the season. Now for us, it's usually like the beginning of June and it can be the difference of like the end of May where we have every single piece of equipment we own out. Every crappy, you know, plywood bottom board, you know, and wondering if we have to get more equipment. And then literally seven days later, we're pulling equipment because it's like if they haven't built comb, they're not going to. And, and so we're pulling boxes off. I know yeah. your season in New Jersey is different it is and for um, the 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 people the non-beekeepers that are um participating tonight when we talk about comb is that uh, bees have to consume about eight pounds worth of honey to make one pound of wax and um bees have glands on their abdomens that where they secrete the wax and then they have right by their mouth little mandibles and that's what they use to to manipulate the wax into different shapes and uh, for those, this is, I actually have some comb with me. And it's just amazing when you look at it up close and see how bees are such great architects and how they create the comb. But like Bonnie's saying, if there's no, if there's no moisture, so there's no nectar, then the bees don't have that eight pounds to create any wax. So it's season over. Yeah, and, and then it literally is another eight months before they can do it again. So unlike, you know, like this, uh, what what we as humans have been able to do with our environment, it's it, it's really much more on like mother earth cycle, you know, like what we're doing, you know, how we're doing it, and and, and realizing that and kind of appreciating that that comes with it. Yeah, and that's why it's so great that uh, Copperfields is doing this on Earth Day because of the role that the honeybee plays. And it was last spring when I can't remember the world organization, but they named the honeybee as the most important creature on the planet because of how many other creatures and plants rely on them uh, to, to keep, to keep going and eating. Um, and it's, you know, I, I kind of, I like to say that the honeybee is kind of like the panda 
you know, it's the symbol for everything. So um, it just makes it doubly special to be here on Earth Day and uh, that we can talk about the great role that bees play and uh, what other folks, um, like some fun facts about bees as well as what people who aren't beekeepers can do to, to help. Yeah. So, so what are, what are some of your favorite facts about bees? Um, I, I, I think when I talk about, um, if I had, a, it's funny, I was thinking about this earlier today, but I, to me, what blows me away is how much math the bees know. Like um, there was a study done in Australia and they were able to prove that bees can count to the number four. They're the only invertebrate or invertebrate that can do that. And they're one of the few animals on the planet that understand the concept of zero. It's pretty amazing what the what the girls can do. Oh, oh, I called them the girls, which is my <laughs> habit. And I saw in your book, like you said, like you don't call them the girls, but I do. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, I, I guess this is one of those things where they say, you know, ask two beekeepers the same question, you get three opinions. You know, yes. and I, I can't help but call them. Maybe it's because I don't have kids, you know, but I've got a lot of beehives, you know, so they're the girls. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, yeah. In, and in my book, I, I talk about people that call bees the girls. And sometimes to me, when I hear some some people say it, it sounds a little creepy, you know, like, oh, my girls better be working for me. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But how about you? What are some of your favorite bee facts? What are some of my favorite bee facts? I'm just amazed, like, I mean, like at, at how many miles they can travel, that, you know, that those foragers, I mean, these foragers that maybe are only foraging for three weeks in their short lives can travel 500 miles. I mean, that just blows me away. So here in California, that would be like to, to Los Angeles and halfway back uh, from San Francisco. And that's amazing for these little tiny critters. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and along those and it, lines. It always amazes me too that, you know, I mean, that it takes. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, it, and along those same lines. Yeah. It amazes me that it takes a combined flight miles of 56,000 miles for every pound of honey that the bees create because it takes 2 million flowers. Yeah. So it's, yeah, but 2 million flowers for one pound of honey. And so for them to go to that many flowers, it's essentially going around the earth twice. Amazing. Yeah, it, it's it's just truly amazing, you know, how they can do that. I mean, the cooperation that happens within a hive, but that kind of goes along too with what you and I were talking about earlier. You know, sometimes I get asked by people like at county fairs or whatever who who think that, you know, beekeepers are somehow abusing their bees and taking their honey, you know. And um, I, I know for me, like the answer is like we as beekeepers, you know, um, and I know you have this in your book, like there are bee havers and there are bee keepers. Bee havers tend to be a smaller number because most beekeepers tend to be, you know, pretty in, in, you know, involved with their bees. Um, but, you know, we're like trying to make sure they don't swarm um, and therefore they're putting their excess of energy into honey production as opposed to reproduction. Um, and, and therefore that that's where we get our honey from. So it's not really stealing from them. It's, you know, it, it's, it's a, it's a relationship we have with them, you know? But yes. Will... Yeah. And the thing is like in nature, do, that... do you ever get questioned by the vegans? At... Yes. Yes, I do. And, um, and, and the thing that, <laughs> yeah. that I try to explain to them is that, um, or in people in general, the thing that's hurting bees around the world right now is there's a parasitic mite called Varroa destructor. And uh, Varroa feeds on uh, the developing bees, the baby bees or brood as we call it, and sucking the nutrients out. So think of like a prenatal, how important nutrients are. And imagine if there was a parasite sucking that away, um, that's what they're doing. And additionally, these mites are vector for diseases. So as we're living through this um, socially distanced era right now, bees can't do that. So these mites are actually spreading more viruses and making it more deadly. And since the, the mites arrived in the US, which was in 1987, that most feral colonies like wild bees, honeybees have died off because of, of the varroa mite. So what I always say is, look, if it wasn't for the beekeeper, the bee population would decline or, or almost become non-existent. So we're in exchange for the honey we're taking, we're keeping the species going. 
Well, I mean, when you look at it, I mean, our our commercial agricultural system is really built on the back of honeybees. Yeah. It's really built on the back of being able to close up thousands of pollinators and move them where you want. It's kind of at a breaking point, you know, I mean, so like here in California, two thirds of all bees in the United States are required for the almond pollination. It's the biggest almond pollination event in the world. Yeah. Part of the reason that that many bees are needed is that because of the way we farm today, we've annihilated the local, the native bees. You know, I grew up in the Central Valley. There were a lot more crops back in the Central Valley when I was growing up than there are now because of the price of almonds. But, you know, um, before European honeybees came here, there are 4,000 species of native bees. You know, here in California, 1,600 species. Even right here in Marin County, 100 species. But boy, but with our, our monoculture, we've certainly changed things and we really rely on honeybees for yeah, our pollination. And like, you know, what you said with the almonds, with that, you know, that, that was reported last that I read $7.6 billion industry and it's 100% dependent on the honeybee. But um, you're also right, like just like, you know, the, the equivalent of honeybees being in a monoculture environment is the same as, as people living on just McDonald's and nothing else. Like they need to have the diversity of food. So that's why if other things were planted around the almonds, then that would help sustain the bees while they're there. And, and there is a shift back to that, you know, to more regenerative farming and, and doing that. But we've definitely, like on so many things with our planet, which is appropriate to talk about on Earth Day, we've really, we pushed it so far. And now we're realizing we need to start bringing that shift back, you know, and, and it's important for everyone, like for everyone in their backyards, you know, to help with that. Yes. And that's, that's what's so, I think, special about, um, Earth Day in general is it's a way for a wake up call for everybody. And um, I think that's the, you know, the, the, the good thing about the, uh, or the silver lining, if you will, about when bees started to decline is a lot of people became beekeepers because they wanted to help not just the honeybee, but also the planet. And this past year that I think that um, there's been more people that want to get back to nature and so we're seeing uh, an increased interest in beekeeping, which I think is great because I think, you know, the, the more as a society that we can get in touch with what it's like to be outside and, and help things grow, the better it is for everybody. Yeah, I, I get asked that a lot by some people like, uh, uh, oddly enough, you know, always they seem to be from European descent. So we're not native here, you know, like, but talking about the non-native, uh, uh, you know, honeybees are not native, they're European honeybees, you know, and talking about them being kind of invasive. But as we were talking about, I mean, we've come to depend on them for their, our crops. And, and also, I think it's really been, like you said, people have gotten, gotten there's been this renewed interest in them. And then people um, through the honeybees, they become more interested in what plants are on their properties and what they're feeding. And through that, it's a conduit to our native bees and native insects, um, you know, and just ecology in general, which is amazing. And, and Bonnie, what I, what I admire about you, and, and you're really a good um, example of this, is that beekeepers, we care more about all, all pollinators. It's not just about the honeybee. You know, it's a, and when we manage our hives, we have to think of what impact we're making on the native pollinators. And you do such a wonderful job of that and promoting that. Yeah, thank you very much. And, and, and so do you. And, um, you know, I, I always think then like talking about just like the honeybees and I always laugh about in your book, like going back to your book, because that's what we're here to talk about tonight. <laughs> I love the comment you make about your first beekeeper meeting and like every that everyone there was 300 years older than you were, because <laughs> it's so true, like in beekeeping, you know, up up until the last like decade or so, you know, when people thought about beekeepers, they thought of old white half balding men you know who'd been doing it for for decades and suddenly um, in the last 10 years or so because of the interest and concern about honeybees loss of bees loss of biodiversity now you've got you know all these people of 
of um, you know all different ages. As you mentioned in in one page, they're talking about you going to the state meeting, all different sizes, all different shapes, um, half men, half women. And I don't know about you, Frank, but I mean, I work with families. I work with kids. I mean, I had this one client who was literally she was ten years old who I was working with. You know, she's now sixteen. It's very exciting. You know, but she was so excited about bees. Um, and, and through bees, you know, you see the shifts in people's gardens, like what they're planting and what they're doing. And it's very exciting. Yeah. And, and, and like kids are great. But I'm sure you, you saw that. Yes. I, 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 with kids, it's always fun. So I, my, both of my daughters, um, they're now six and four, but when each of them were, was three that they came to the bee yard with me, they had on their suits and they were holding a frame of bees. So again, like three, 4,000 bees are on there. And at that age, they have no fear. They just ha have excitement and, and curiosity. Um, and that's, and I love to, and I talk about this in the book. I love to do talks at schools because kids always ask the best questions. <laughs> they really and, do. And that 10 year old I was talking about, like she, she came out with her mom to a workshop I did and she was the only young person there. And, and she took the best notes and she asked the be best questions. The other thing I like about kids is when they're in my classes, they're the ones that can fi fix the PowerPoint presenter or my <laughs> computer when I have problems. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not the adults. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. and, and, it's, and it's really great to just see kids um, that they wanna be outside because with the, the thing I always say about beekeeping is it gets you off the couch and gets you away from being in front of a screen. And so to have young people that are willingly putting down the phones and the iPads and all that stuff to go hang out with bugs is pretty awesome. Oh yeah, it, it's definitely odd. And they're really into it. They're really into it. Yeah, we yeah. see that around here too, like with the, it's the elementary schools that have the pollinator gardens. Um, and actually I've been working with a group of college students here in Marin um, who, who I thought we were just working on trying to get a grant for Habitat Garden, but it turns out like the facilities and the risk management team is afraid that if you plant for pollinators, people will be afraid to come to the location because of stinging insects, which is crazy to me, but <laughs> you know. Yeah, especially so. like as you, as you talked about how how many miles they travel like you know a honeybee just one of the pollinators you know on average they're traveling three miles from their hive and they can travel over five so to think that by becoming a food source is going to be make it more dangerous is just forgetting about nature and how everything plays together yeah yeah, exactly. So the, the bees in your area, I mean, here in Marin, we have a lot of different microclimates and I, you know, I mean, bees are incredibly efficient. So I would imagine at this time of the year, most of our honeybees are probably not traveling more than a mile, but by the end of summer, I would imagine they are traveling three to five miles. So in your area of New Jersey, what do you think the general range is for your bees? Yeah, it's a good question. Cause it's um, like, it's, it's funny. And I talk about this one of the later chapters. I, um, from my, my, my club is a County essentially. And so in New Jersey, which is a significantly smaller state than California, um, it's divided into 10 branches. So, you know, by your standards, it's pretty tiny, but it's also the most densely populated County in the most densely populated state. But, um, so I created a honey tasting competition where we would bring in the general public and everyone that shows up gets to vote on what's their favorite tasting honey. And so for, for such a small geographic area, it's amazing to me the different flavors and tastes of honey. And also that every year we've done the honey cup, that there's been one clear winner. Like I'm always afraid it's honey, it's going to be a tie, but there's always one that everyone's like, that's the best one. So yeah, so it is, it is interesting how even though they're very close together, that they they forage differently or at least in different percentages of where they're going. Yeah. Yeah. It is pretty, the bees are pretty fascinating with that, you know, their, their preferences. And um, in my area, um, you know, you, you, talk about... oh, I'm sorry. In my area, and I was going to say that um, in, in, in suburban, 
when you talk about the, you know, it takes 2 million flowers for a pound and then the, the bees need to make 60 to 80 pounds for themselves to make it through the winter before I start taking any honey off for myself, which I do that by, as you do, by adding boxes on top. So when you think of the quantity of flowers necessary around here, that the, they tend to go to trees. So we have a lot of linden trees and black locusts, and that's what our honey source mostly is. Yeah, so I'm glad you mentioned that because anyone listening who maybe not be a beekeeper around here and thinking about because I know in your book you talk about how beekeeping is the one hobby like where you know you can actually cover the cost for it and in here that's not the same case as what you're doing so you mentioned like your bees need 60 to 80 pounds of honey to overwinter our bees probably only need about 30 pounds because you know um, we don't really have winter our winter is hot and brown when things dry up during the summer yours is cold and white or whitish you know, <laughs> you know and so they need more here most of our native trees are they provide a lot of pollen but not nectar so um we you know i would say like your book you were talking about some pretty big numbers that for a new person who's not a beekeeper it sounds pretty awesome and the numbers seem like I'm going to make a fortune, you know, like I've got a few hives, but here in Marin, what Gary and I have found, especially with all of our different uh, microclimates, some more than others, but on average, we can only get about 30 pounds of excess honey off of a hive, you know, where you can get you know, like that seven foot hive you talk about, that was pretty significant. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was my all time uh, best producing hive. And including the honey it made for itself, that hive made 340 pounds of honey in one season. <laughs> That's amazing. Back in the old days, before there were so many beekeepers in Marin, the Southern area where the non-native eucalyptus is, is, uh, is um, pretty significant. Um, you know, some of the old time beekeepers talk about being able to get like 200 pounds off a hive. But you wow. just don't see that even in that area, you don't get that anymore because there's a lot of beekeepers, you know? I mean, here in Marin, um, in 2005, there was 25 members of the Marin Beekeepers Association or Marin County Beekeepers is what they're called. Um, today, 350, you know? Wow. Um, but probably overall about 2000 beekeepers in Marin today, you know? So- uh, that that's an amazing number. Like in, in all like the, the state of New Jersey beekeeping organization has about 1700 members and we estimate it's about 2,500 total in the whole state. And that's just one County for you. That's fantastic. <laughs> I mean, it's bad, that's but it's, it's amazing. It's only 2,500 that you estimate with everything going on today. And I mean, do your Costco's carry bee equipment like ours do? <laughs> no, <laughs> that, I, I, I wish they did, but no, we, we do have some um, tractor supply companies that do, but we're lucky because we have a few distributors here um, in the state and also close by. So that's how we get it. And, and for those that are listening, what's funny is, is like, and I never realized this um, before I got into bees, but where do you buy bee stuff? And so there's actually companies that specialize in selling everything you need. And those suppliers have catalogs um, and, and, and websites now, but it's just uh, amazing to think that these, in like the oldest one, Dedant, has been around since the 1800s and the companies are able to exist for that long of time selling just bee equipment. Yeah, well, I mean, the Sears catalog used to be able to not only buy bee equipment, but you used to be able to buy bees. Yes. Sears catalog. And, and what's funny and about packages that, of bees. Right. And then the packages of bees to this day can still be mailed through the U.S. postal system. And um, it is funny if um, I don't I'm sure that you've picked up bees or have heard of people picking up bees and the postmen are always like they're somewhere over there. Go get them. <laughs> What's really funny is, you know, we, we got queens from Kirk Webster one year and, you know, Kirk only sells like, he's not even selling them anymore to like individuals, but he only sells like 300 queens a year and his, his bees are premium. So for anyone listening in on this, you know, this is like the, the kind of the patriarch of treatment for beekeeping in America. He's in Vermont and we were expecting a package of 20 of his queens one year. And I had the tracking information for the U.S. Postal Service. 
And it said they were at this site and Gary went and he's like, you know, they said, no, 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 we don't have them. He's like, no, no, it says you have them. You know, <laughs> like we're not letting these bees, very valuable bees, you know, go. No, no, we don't have them. And he's like, my wife is on the phone saying, I can't leave because you have them, you know? <laughs> and it turned out that someone was afraid of bees, heard the buzzing, and it stuck them in the back room, like on a back shelf somewhere, you know? Oh, That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and these kind of stories that Bonnie and I are telling, like this is, this is how the book started, was because beekeepers are always telling funny stories back and forth. And eventually somebody would say, you know, somebody should write a book about all this funny stuff. So I'm like, you know what? That's what I'm going to do. And uh, it, it's funny with that. Like, so last year during the pandemic, so you think about how all the rules that were in place with that. Um, so there's a UPS facility that's about 15 minutes away from me and people were shipping uh, packages in these plastic containers. And at this UPS facility, they kept falling off the line and breaking. So they were calling me. And so it's funny you know, so all the security in this plant, right? But I, so I, they just wave me through the fence. Like there's all these 18 wheelers and just me and my car. And then I pull up and then they're like, it's in there, go in there. And I'm thinking, man, I'm walking around this UPS facility without an escort because they don't want to go by the bees. And then I just picked it up and I was walking out and they're like, do you need any equipment? I'm like, no, I'm just going to put it in my car. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so funny, like people like when I do beginner classes and talk about how you can get queens, although it's really scary because the US Postal Service is so slow right now, even when you get it supposedly overnight. But you know, I mean, I've got all these examples of like, you know, just envelopes with holes punched in them and handwritten queen bees inside, you know, <laughs> like, you know, or like priority mail envelopes with holes punched in them. And you know, it's, yeah, it's pretty crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's, and that's, and the thing that's fun too about beekeeping is all the great people you meet. I mean, you know, I'm in New Jersey, you're in California. We met in Nevada at the Nevada state beekeeping meeting. And it's just like, it's like this fraternal order that once you keep yeah. bees, you have friends literally around the world. And I think that's so special. And you you meet people in common. So um, as you and I met, Frank, after your presentation, you had a, a picture in your presentation of a friend of ours. <laughs> you know? And I remember coming up to you afterwards and was like, have you met him? And you're like, oh, no, I have no idea. And he's like, well, he's a friend of ours. And you felt a little comfortable at first because you were kind of making fun of him. You know? yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so and Bonnie's referring to there's uh, it's Professor Michael Smith. Um, from Cornell University, and he had done this study to see where it hurts the most to get stung. And so this was a scientific study, and it won what's called the Ing Nobel Prize because it's 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 a study that's funny, but it's true science. And so he stung himself three different times in 25 locations all over his body, and I mean everywhere on his body. All, and, all over his body. Yeah. <laughs> And so out of all the places he stung, and remember, he did this three times to find it out that what stung the word hurt the most was inside his nose. <laughs> I believe it. Have you been stung up the nose, Frank? No, that, thankfully, no. <laughs> How about you? Uh, I have. And I'll tell you what, it, it's definitely the most painful because I've been stung pretty much everywhere. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and now Michael, I believe, is in Austria um, doing. Oh my God. So, hey, Frank, speaking of like funny stories, I mean, uh, funny stories. So, what is one of the most funny stories you've heard about stings? I mean, we've all got them. But, yeah, I am. Um, you know, well, in, in your book, frankly, it was. Yeah. <laughs> Go for it. it yeah, in, in my book, I think the. Um, I tell, I tell a couple of different stories. The one is when I got a lot of stings um, at one time, but I think to me, what was some of the, 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 the funnier ones uh, for me. And again, for those non beekeepers listening, yes, beekeepers think it's funny when they get stung, <laughs> but uh, I, I have a non beekeeping job. So I um, used to work in Manhattan and would take the train in. And there were a few times when I get stung on my face and then my, 
my eyes would swell up. So by the time I got into work, it looked like I was in some sort of fist fight. <laughs> so I always felt like um, Ed Norton and Fight Club at those days, because it's like people are looking at you cross-eyed, like, what did you get into? <laughs> What's some of your funny stories, Bonnie? Uh, oh, no, definitely. Well, I, I mean, um, like you said, I mean, before I was working bees full time, uh, one of the worst was second year beekeeping and getting stung up the nose. And I was totally unrecognizable for like three days. But yeah, I, I was laughing about the story in your book, about, you know, um, that that nuke box at the church at night and getting bees walking up and stinging you on your chest. You know, and, and you were saying like, yeah, you should, it, it was a, it was a lesson, like you should never work bees at night, but you know what, sometimes you don't have a choice. So one of our worst experiences was we were literally flying back from the East coast from visiting my mom. We were taxing at SFO at 9 PM. I turn on my phone and I'm getting a call from one of our property owners and we have bees and she never calls me. So I knew something was happening. <laughs> so I answered it. And two hives had gone down because of a lot of rain and, and gopher holes. Oh, wow. And I asked when the next rain was coming and it was going to be before the next morning. So we had to go from SFO to home with our gear to out there. So we get out there like 11 o'clock at night and there's two hives totally torn apart, very upset. And we had red flashlights. So, you know, bees don't see red but I didn't have a headlamp at that time. I just had a flashlight. So I had a full suit and gloves on, but the flashlight was in my mouth with the veil. And so the bees didn't find me for a very long time. But once one stung me on the lip where it was touching, they all found it. <laughs> like you mentioned, you know, I mean, once that pheromone's on you, that's it, it's a bullseye. So, you know, even though it's night, now they can all find me. And I had the most incredible Botox around my lips. <laughs> you know? So, yeah. That is funny. Yeah. yeah. And so a couple of points. So like the reason we say you don't work bees at night is because bees only fly during the daylight. So at night they crawl. So if, if you're holding a box that has bees in it, then they're just going to walk up your arms and, and all over you. Um, and then the second thing is that, so bees communicate two different ways. They communicate through dances, which is called the waggle dance. And that's how they get direct um, their sister bees to food sources. And another interesting bee fact is there's only two creatures on the planet that give directions to food sources, honeybees and people. And the other way that bees communicate is through pheromones or smells. Only bees don't have noses, they have antenna. So one of the pheromones that they give off when um, you're stung, there's a pheromone that acts as a bullseye. And if you think about it from an evolutionary standpoint, it makes sense because if a bee stings, it's, it's, it's stinging to defend its, its hive or home. And so by putting a bullseye there, it makes other uh, guard bees able to find the target much easier. Yeah. So, you know, you talk about like with that nuke that you moved at night, you know, your left man boob, whenever I hear that phrase, I'm going to laugh and think of you, Frank, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're getting all stuck up. Um, that was my lip that night. Oh. So, you know, that's what they found. It's, it's where, you know, the, the, the flashlight was in my mouth, <laughs> you know, and Gary thought it was really funny. He really wanted to take pictures of all the amusing <laughs> swelling that was going on in my face. I did not find it that amusing. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, you have to learn to laugh because as I say in the book, it's better to laugh about it than cry about it. Yeah, exactly. And obviously I'm laughing about it right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, I see just, Jamie uh, popping back up. So it's so fascinating hearing you guys talk, but there are quite a few questions and I wanna make sure we leave just enough time to touch on some of those. Um, Bonnie, do you see where they are? Do you mind um, kind of shooting those out or do you want me to ask the questions? Um, I can go ahead. Let me just start. No, and, I, I've got it right here. Um, tons of fe great feedback for you both coming in as well, by the way. Okay, well, thank so you everybody. How I, much I, space is needed between bees and children minimum space needed for a beehive. Do you want to, do you want to take that Frank? Sure. So um, 
there it, it's legal to keep honeybees in uh, New York City as well as in the city of San Francisco. So you really don't need a lot of room um, other than having a few feet around the hive for you to physically stand and work in it. As far as to make sure that the bees aren't um, a problem for people, you can put up a flight barrier. So bees will naturally, when they leave the hive within 15 feet, they go up and they cruise at about 30 feet. That's their cruising altitude. So if you put a six foot bush or fence within 10 feet of the hive, then that forces them up to that 30 feet faster. So that's how you can keep um, out of the way of other, other you know, kids or people in general. Um, hey, Frank, because I did mention this to, as, as I sent this out to the Marin beekeepers today, and we didn't talk about this, but oh my gosh, it makes me laugh. What's the story about the beekeeper who never used smoke and ended up on the lawn? <laughs> you, you got it. You got it. That's just funny. Yeah. So um, back to the pheromones that we were talking about, that that's why bee, beekeepers use a smoker, because I, I say to kids, it's like when they're in in school and they hear the fire alarm go off, they know to go outside. So a smoker or smoke in the hive acts as a block. So even if that fire alarm is going off, they can't, they can't detect it. So they just keep doing what they're doing. And so there's a whole story in, in the book about this one beekeeper who didn't believe in using smoke, even though it's been used since we were lived in caves. Um, and uh, so one of her mentees also didn't use smoke and so he went out into the hives without smoke. And also um, because he, he wore a full bee suit, which is like a jumpsuit and he didn't wear anything underneath. And so he didn't really know what he's doing. And he's in the hive pulling out uh, different frames, looking for a, a good one with honey. And um, he didn't zip up his suit all the way. So he got a bee in his veil. And what you're supposed to do is walk away from your hives and what he decided to do was open the veil to let the bee out. But instead of letting the bee out, he let more in. And so then he took it all the way off and then started to run away. And uh, <laughs> then then he, he tripped over the suit because it was like a jumpsuit trailing behind him. And he bonked his head and, and conked out is the, is the story. And um, that was the last time he kept bees, Bonnie, I guess is the <laughs> where uh, you wanted to know. He had, he had had enough and um, I, he told me that story himself. So when I, all the stuff in the book came directly from him. Um, so just, just absolutely amazing. <laughs> Gary and I were wondering about that. <laughs> like where did that come from? Where did that information all came from? Yeah. That's really funny. I, um, here's a comment from Anthony. Um, he used to get his bees to the U.S. Postal Service early on and got them from Montgomery Wards. So, yeah. That is Pretty fantastic. I had never heard Montgomery Wards did it. So that that is wonderful to hear that. Um, Stephen Pollock said, isn't being stung just free apitherapy? I'll answer that. Um, Yes and no, because I actually pay to get stung in the off season and um, my apitherapist, because I have MS and my, my relapses have happened in the off season and the gal that I pay to sting me says, you shouldn't be relying on them to like sting you in the right places. So it's not necessarily just free apitherapy. Although I figure during the on season, I get stung enough that in, and in plenty of places where I'm pretty sure I'm covered. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, um, Barbara Sprout asks, I live in an apartment complex and been thinking about getting mason bee habitat and ordering cocoons online. Any tips for keeping mason bees? Yeah, and so as- I, I don't know about you, Frank, I don't necessarily have any tips for but go ahead. Yeah, I, I was going to say, as beekeepers, we're, our specialty is um, Apis mellifera. And so while mason bees, their houses are cool, I would just recommend um, wherever you're going to buy them to look for information. Other than that, I, I can't offer any tips either. But except to say thumbs up yeah, for doing it. Yeah, the only tip I can offer is I know that you can only get them while it's cool. So I, I believe it's November to February when you can when they'll ship them. Um, 
I've tried them out in a couple of places that are farms um, and have seen them, you know, actually come back and nest. Um, but yeah, do, do I, I'm not definitely not an expert on that. So do some research on that. Um, let's see what else we have here. Um, Stephen asked, do you, do you treat your hive for mites? And so what do you use? Frank, do you want to answer that? I saw yeah, you so got I, some information about it. Yeah, I, um, I, I'm a big believer in treating for mites and back to New Jersey being the most densely populated county in the most densely populated state that everyone's bees touches one another. So here, because of that dense population of beekeepers, that it's your, it, your decisions are impacting your community, not just your own hives. And so I treat with um, both Apivar and oxalic acid vapor. Those are my two go-tos. And then if I need to, I would um, potentially use uh, formic acid if I had a, a problem during when the honey supers were on, because formic acid is the only treatment you can have while honey supers are on. Um, so I see a question here from Val to the panelists. I guess that would be us. Do you see any conflict between keeping honeybees and the impact on native bees? And can an area have too many beekeepers? Um, well, I'll comment on that. And then I'm sure Frank has an opinion. I know that, that that has definitely been shown. I mean, in areas like Santa Fe, New Mexico and London, where there were so many beekeepers that there was an issue with forage. And then people responded by planting more habitat and they've got one of the most amazing habitat corridors there. And yes, there, there's, there's different research showing that where um, European honeybees can actually, um, you know, that, that increase in foraging can help um, native bees. And then other research showing it can be negative. They definitely can share, uh, you know, um, diseases with them. Personally, what I tell people is, yeah, I think like in our area, we probably have too many beekeepers. However, it's hard to be a bee and it's hard to be a beekeeper and some of those people are gonna drop out. But what's left in their wake is people that are much more conscious about what they're planting and limit, eliminating chemical use. Um, and the knowledge that's left behind, I think ultimately things will uh, equal out, but the, um, what's the, the benefit being done by them, I think outweighs the short-term negatives of it. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I think this, the thing that I like to always point out is that the, the crops that honeybees are pollinating are also not native. Almonds aren't native to California, either in apples, oranges, and all the other fruits are not native to North America. So not only are the, the honeybees not native, but what they're what we consume is also not from North America. And, and that's, as I said earlier too, is I think to be a good beekeeper, you have to be a steward for all pollinators and you have to, you know, and this goes to why you should treat for mites because the mites spread disease to, to, to other pollinators. So the better you are being a beekeeper, the better you can ensure the health of other pollinators. And Bonnie, since you brought up that, um, how it's important to plant uh, for all pollinators. Why don't you take a minute and let's talk about this great initiative that you have, the 10 by 10 for 10. Thank you, thank you for that. So yeah, let's, and before we talk about that, I mean, as far as how people wanna help bees here, here we're on Earth Day, some of the best things they can do are one, plant natives. You know, what's native to your area? Because, um, you know, that's, what the native insects and pollinators um, evolved with. And that, that's what's gonna help, you know, all this loss of native uh, pollinators that we've heard about. If you plant for natives, you're gonna help for that. Um, the research that uh, UC Berkeley has done has shown that because, and you mentioned this in your book, Frank, you know, because bees wanna uh, go on a single floral source at any given time, shown that bees like at least a three by three space of one plant, of any type of plant, um, to be attracted to it. So if you're planting for pollinators, please, you know, like think about that, a bigger space to attract them. So native plants, bigger space. And then thank you, Frank. So this came out of this initiative, 10 by 10 plus 10 came out of um, at the Be Audacious conference in 2016. And um, it's really the idea of like, how can individuals help? 
and, um, and you know planning for pollinators, pollinator corridors, as well as bigger projects. So the concept is if people can plant 10 feet by 10 feet for pollinators, and then by buying the sign, um, your sign purchase also helps with giving $10 to a larger habitat restoration project. So we've just rolled out this website, 10 by 10 plus 10.com um, just in the last few months. And uh, we've already been able to um, uh, create a, a finance, a new pollinator habitat at a local elementary school. So we're hoping to make this a much bigger initiative. Yeah, that's fantastic. But yeah, if everyone, you know, what we were saying earlier on, I think Frank, you know, well, no, Frank, you and I were talking before this presentation and I was saying a study we did here in our local city, 25 front yards, only eight native plants in 25 front yards, eight total in 25 front yards. So if everyone can just do a little bit, it collectively up to a lot. Um, and, and I think, you know, with COVID and everything else, we've all like, that's been reinforced. The individual actions we all take collectively really do make a difference. Yes. So 10 foot by 10 foot in your yard somewhere, it's a huge difference. Absolutely a great thing. Then what are some of the other questions we have? Are you still there, Frank? I yes, I am. Oh, I was saying, yeah. do we have any other questions? Sorry, I thought I lost you. <laughs> Does anyone have any other questions? So we do have just a couple more questions. Um, I know we're getting down to it, but let me go ahead and just, you know, thank you all. Everyone is saying it's been so great hearing from both of you. You know, people are really looking forward to reading the book and many who have read it already. I do want to share one story from Anthony. He says one of his funniest stories is picking up pollination nooks in an orchard one night, about eight of us in white bee suits and having a neighbor call the police because she thought a KKK meeting was being held. They oh, had gosh. a police escort them out of town. <laughs> wow, so, okay, last couple minutes. Um, Stephen is wondering, what are your thoughts on capturing swarms versus swarm traps or in the wild versus only raising your own stock? Swarms are free bees. So I, I think it's, it's great to catch them. Um, like I, and I, I have some funny stories with that as well. And then there's a picture in, in my book that I have my hand actually on a swarm. And that's because, you know, bees are defend, they'll, they'll sting to defend their hive. Um, and so since when they're, they're a swarm, they're a big ball of bees that you see just hanging out, they have no home to protect. So that's why that they're not defensive. And also before bees swarm, they eat as much honey as they can. So I always say they're like us after a Thanksgiving meal, they just want to hang out. Um, but yeah, I would, I, I like catching swarms. I think it's fun. Um, the one thing I would say is that if you catch a swarm, you should use oxalic acid dribble to get the mites off before they, you bring it back to your yard. Thanks for that. And one last question from Denise. She's been, her, she was the first question. It's a little personal, but she's been wanting to get a beehive with windows so I can watch them all the time without opening it all the time. I then read one beak opine that said the light really bothers them and they will eventually abscond if you have those windows. But like you said, you hold them up in the light and they don't seem to care. Do you have any ideas about this? Well, it's it, so yes, yeah, so in nature and even in our hives, um, the, the, the bees work in complete darkness. So they, they would not do well in a, in a, like a glass cage, if you, you will. In the hives that have the windows, they have like little wood that goes over them. So you just remove that piece to look in when you're there outside. Now, if you're, if you're referring to the observation hive, which can be inside a house and have a tube out, that would be all glass. Then yeah, the, 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 there's a lot problems about that because the, the, the bees don't have a lot of space. So as Bonnie and I were talking about swarming, they're more likely to swarm and things like that. So I guess my comment would be, if you want a hive with windows, get the kind that can be, have pieces of wood go over top of it. So when you're not looking, it's covered. Um, and then, but still know that you're gonna have to go in to, you can't just manage the bees by looking through the window. 
It's very thorough. Thank you so much. This was such a perfect event for our Earth Day. I want to thank you, Bonnie. I want to thank you, Frank, for taking the time out of your evening to share with us. For all of you listening and watching, you will get the email tomorrow with a link to rewatch this recording, uh, details for purchasing, as well as the discount code and websites for both Bonnie and Frank. So all of the info will be included and um, I'm going to hand it over to you. Why don't you take us out, Frank? All right. Well, and, and I'd like to th thank you, Jamie, and everyone at Copperfields for this. You know, it's I, I think for all the people that are local, you don't realize what a special store Copperfields is like even out here um, in New Jersey, I've had friends that have heard about it. So I, I would encourage everyone that's listening to please visit them, uh, go into the store and buy the books because that's how they can keep doing such great things and be such a great resource in your community. And uh, for all that are interested in bees, I say thank you very much. Thank you guys. Have a great evening. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.